All right, this is the last of the homework problems, and uh, it's uh, somewhat challenging, perhaps. Um, you should watch the previous example, the general strategy for doing for derivations of biconditional space, because I'm going to use it in this uh, in doing this derivation. So let's bring in our premises, and we can't really do anything with those as they stand, and so we can go through our reasoning, which says, how are we going to complete the derivation? Box and cancel. How are we going to box and cancel? What's going to have to be with direct derivation? Because it's not going to be with conditional derivation, and those are our only two options. So that means we need to get P if and only if R on a line. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, probably we're going to uh, use the formation rule, the rule that forms by conditionals. And what do we apply that to? We apply it to the component conditionals. So what we want are if P then R, and if R then P, and then we'll apply CB, and uh, we'll have the conclusion. So what we know then is we're going to say we're going to use this show cond, and let me back up. We're going to need to do subderivations uh, to get 7 and 8 because we can't do anything else. So we have to do subderivations. And they're going to be separate subderivations. And the uh, program has this shortcut command for both of them, for the, excuse me, for sh doing this subderivation. So we say show cond, and then we'll say good, uh, we're going to do show of p then r. And then eventually we're going to complete that subderivation. And then we're going to do it again, but this time we're going to do it for the other biconditional. And so we're going to, oh no, I did it wrong. I did I did p if p then r again. Be careful, don't do that. There's no point in doing if p then r again. You already got it. Doing it again will get you nothing new. It'll just be a waste of time. This is what we want. So we want to show if p then r and then show if r then p. Oops. Okay. So we'll complete those two subderivations. Once we do, we'll apply cb to give us p if and only if r and then direct derivation. Okay. So this is what the derivation is going to look like overall. And now we're just going to have to figure out what's going to go inside of these two subderivations. Well, we'll figure that out in the course of doing them. So let's go ahead and get get rolling. So we're going to try to show if p then r first, and then separately we're going to show if r then p. And they need to be done separately so you can access both of them. If you did uh, show if r then p inside, then after you ha had shown if p then r, that's all you would be left with. This is boxed at that point, and so you don't have access to it once you've completed, once you've boxed and canceled that line. So the the derivation of if p then r and of if r then p have to be separate derivations. Okay, so we'll say assume cd because we're trying to show a conditional. And now, oh, well, hmm, lines 2 and 3 are biconditionals, and so we can't you combine them with p, and so it looks like we're kind of stuck. So what should we do? Well, it's actually something we could have done already, which I skipped because I knew it wouldn't have helped at that point. We can apply the rule bc to split up 2 and 3. So we can say 2bc... Two, two L, 2 BCR, 3 BCL, 3 BCR. That's all of the resources we can get from 2 and 3. And now we want to look and see, can we use 5 with any of them? And in fact, we can use 5 with the very first one we did, if P then Q. So we'll go ahead and say 5, 6, most exponents. We have Q. Okay, good. Can we do anything with Q? Well, if we look, we have 7 and 8. 7 and 8 are conditionals who's with q as the antecedent, and we have q on line 10, which means we can do modus ponens. 7 and 10 would be pointless because it would just give us p, which would just be repeating 5. But 8 gives us something new, so we can do 8, 10 modus ponens, and we get r. And hey, r is the consequent of the conditional we're currently trying to show, so we can apply c, d, and we are done with our first subderivation. But we have to do two subderivations because we have to do the subderivation of the other conditional in order to apply CB to get the biconditional to apply direct derivation. So we we say show conditional again, and we make sure to choose the other one. We've we just completed the subderivation of this, so now we're going to do the subderivation of this, and we will say again we're trying to show a conditional, so we can say assume CD. What can we do with R? Well. This stuff is boxed now, so we can't use it. So what can we do with R? Can we do anything with R in line 4? No. R in line 3? No. R in line 2? No. But 3 is a biconditional, and there's an R in it, so maybe we can get a good conditional out of it. In particular, we can get 
this conditional if r then q out of line 3. So, oh, good, okay, we can do modus ponens, which gives us q. Okay, well, can we do anything with q? There's actually a bunch of things we can do with q. We can get if q then r from line 3, and we can apply modus ponens to 16 and 17. Is that a good idea? No, it's legal, but it's not going to help us because we, it's just going to give us r, which we already have on line 14. So we don't like this, but we can get if q then p from line 2. And that is good because that's actually going to give us p, which is what we want to complete this subderivation. Oh, good, we're done because now we can put 4 and 13 together like we always wanted to do like peanut butter and chocolate or other two other things that go together well <laughs> and we get our conclusion uh, which is uh, P if and only if R that's the conclusion and so we can apply direct derivation so there we go we're done hey good so there are a couple different ways you can you can do this we had the did the BC split ups inside of the two subderivations, you could have put them outside. So we could have done uh, the by the applications of BC outside of the subderivations, and then we we wouldn't have had them inside of the subderivations. It doesn't matter. We need to use. We end up needing all four of these, though. So we need to make sure we do get enough. Um, we do make enough applications of BC to our two premises. If you don't do enough applications of BC to our two premises, you're not going to be able to complete the subderivation. And we use both 2 and 3 in both of the subderivations, right? For this subderivation, we use this line if P then Q from line 2, and we use this line if Q then R from line 3. And similarly, we, here we use 3 BCR, and here we use 2 BCR. So we need to use, in this case, both of the premises in both of the subderivations. But if we make sure we do both of the subderivations and make sure to use the premises as much as we can, then uh, the derivation goes through fairly straightforwardly. We get, we complete the two subderivations, we apply CB, and then we apply DD, and we're done. So this, again, illustrates the general format of a derivation of a biconditional where you show each of the component conditionals and sometimes you'll re you know you'll use a premise in both of the subderivations sometimes you won't in other situations the premises you would use for one subderivation are going to be different from the premises you would use for the other subderivation but not always and you can't tell in advance so that is the last of the homework problems the review of the homework problems you can submit these, uh, and you will get credit on the assignment that's due on Friday, uh, and the assignment that's due on Thursday for these problems, they will count as extra credit, so you're not going to be penalized for not having them done uh, on Monday. If you have any questions, please let me know.